everyone, and welcome back to the Marine Corps Suicide Prevention Podcast, where we think about, talk about, and address the physical, mental, spiritual, and social components of the prevention of deaths by suicide. I'm your host, Dr. T.J. Owen, Suicide Prevention Capability Section Head here at Behavior Programs Headquarters, Marine Corps. The Connected Podcast Series is dedicated to the promotion of the prevention throughout uh, the Marine Corps of death by suicide. During this episode, we will discuss ways that commanders can connect with their providers and communicate better in the effort of care and file savers and Marines. With us today, we have the Marine and Family Programs Division Psychologist, Commander Blair. Commander Blair has been assigned to Headquarters Marine Corps for three years and provides support to our behavior programs from the perspective of a provider. I've had the pleasure of serving with him on a number of occasions and benefiting from his expertise as I manage the suicide prevention program for the Marine Corps. One characteristic of this particular leader that has stood out to me is his sincere care for the well-being of our sailors and Marines. Commander Blair, would you uh, do me a favor and introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Dr. Owens, thanks so much for having me on the, the podcast, and thanks for the uh, the kind introduction. So uh, as, uh, as TJ said, I'm uh, uh, Commander Chris Blair. I'm a clinical psychologist, and uh, I have been in the Navy uh, almost 21 years now. Um, so I've been around for a while and I've had lots of uh, fun experiences. It's been uh, great to be in the Navy to just do different things. I've worked at uh, small clinics to uh, major hospitals like uh, um, like Bethesda. Um, I've been uh, stationed on aircraft carriers. I've uh, uh, deployed with Marines, been embedded with Marines, um, just been able to have lots of uh, fun and interesting, unique uh, experiences. And so I'm glad to, to be here to talk to with you today. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time out. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I've served with you for a while now and really appreciated the opportunity to learn from you. But for the purpose of our audience, those who don't know you as well as I do, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences, uh, uh, particularly the ones you might have had in the prevention of death by suicide? And also, in your answer, could you share your opinion on how commanders and providers can connect on this health issue? Sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've got uh, lots of experience. I mean, definitely from the, the clinical side, um, the the one on one uh, meeting with with every client, um, every client, every individual that uh, we meet with, um, I'm assessing for. For safety, I want to make sure that everyone is safe and, and taken care of. I don't want anybody leaving my office where I'm, you know, uh, not feeling uh, comfortable with. And so we're constantly uh, assessing safety. Uh, I've also been um, at uh, like major hospitals, like at, at, at Bethesda or clinics, where um, you know we're we're writing the, the hospital policy on um, uh, you know how to how to better screen for. Um, suicidal thoughts and ideations just because we want to make sure that everyone is is uh, is taken care of um so yes from a clinical one-on-one -on -one standpoint to uh, a policy standpoint always uh looking at how we can better um screen and assess for um you know just uh, thoughts of, of self-harm just want to make sure that uh, people are taken care of okay but well, thank you for that and so as we we I'm sitting here and I was listening to you respond and I'm thinking about, you know, some of the experiences that I've had out there uh, as I uh, go from program to program and I had a privilege of uh, talking to some of our leaders and commanders and providers when uh, we just inspect the program or provide technical expertise and support of the programs. And I ask oftentimes, you know, I ask commanders of their uh, experience with connecting with or talking to other uh, providers. And sometimes I get that feedback. And you know how it is, everybody kind of saying, well, point the finger on the other side of mm -hmm. the fence. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll talk, they'll say something like HIPAA. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we've got HIPAA concerns, so we can't really tell them all the information that maybe they want. But with that in mind, and in your opinion, is this sufficient justification to allow uh, uh, something like stigma to be a barrier when it comes to um, this communication that we're trying to establish between commanders 
and uh, providers. Do you think about that? Yeah. Um, well, there's never there should never be any any barrier um, that uh, prevents anyone from receiving mental health treatment, and so doing our best to dispel uh, stigmas. And a lot of times, it is that. Uh, what kind of communication gets gets back to the command and you know, honestly, there is a difference what commanders want versus what they need um, You know a lot of times they may want more information and they might feel frustrated when well This is the information that you need and we're going to give you all the information necessary to make sure that everyone is, is safe and taken care of but they may feel like they would like uh, more information, uh, but we, we want to make sure that they don't, uh, uh, that we are being true to uh, our clients uh, because they're the holder of the privilege. And we make sure that, at least I do, and every, uh, every provider, the first time that you're going to see somebody, before you even start talking, uh, we make sure that we go over the limits of confidentiality, what we can and can't say uh, that that privilege is not absolute. We're not a chaplain, we're not a priest, you know. But there are things that we can reveal certain information to to commands. And a lot of times, again, when we talk to the the client, letting them know, hey, if I need to talk to the command, uh, this is who I'm going to talk to, and this is what we're going to say. And we keep it to the, the the bare minimum. It might be something as simple as. This person shouldn't go to the range for the next little bit to make sure that we're uh, getting them taken care of. They're starting on a medication, we want to monitor that, uh, and they shouldn't go to, go to the range. But we don't go into their childhood history. We don't go into all the other stuff that's, that's going on. We keep mm -hmm. it short and sweet. What does the command need, need to know? To know. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times being able to provide that information, working with the client, because I can be an advocate for, for the client. I can be a liaison with them. It's a whole lot easier for me as a commander mm -hmm. or just as, as an officer to be able to uh, help communicate back to the command what may be needed or necessary. That Lance Corporal mm -hmm. may feel like I can't talk to my leadership in a certain way, and I could be able to, to, to talk to them uh, and be able to, again, liaison and advocate uh, for them. So HIPAA shouldn't be any barrier to, to treatment, but there are the constant need to, one, educating the providers that, yes, there are things that you can actually provide. There are, there are some things that maybe you can provide more. And also letting the commands know you can't have everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's that balance in educating the providers and the commanders of what uh, what information is necessary and, and is helpful. I get that. That's very helpful. And you don't want to uh, further contribute at the uh, unit level to that, that stigma when it comes to getting care. And so we want to definitely have a unified front mm -hmm. and be professional about it. You know, exactly. uh, you're, you're professional, commander's professional. And we both have our responsibilities, but there still exists great uh, numbers, numerous ways that we can communicate and uh, serve our Marines and sailors. Exactly. Uh, there, there's a lot of talk in uh, public health when it comes to stigma. And this mm -hmm. is something that we uh, work every day here at Headquarters and Marine Corps to figure out how we can address and help commanders address at the unit level. So my question for you is, in the process of trying to overcome stigma, how can commanders and providers work together to uh, uh, lessen, uh, I won't say eradicate, that's just not humanly <laughs> possible, but the barrier that stigma causes uh, to a Marine or a sailor wanting to come up and talk about what's going on with them and get help, what can commanders do to, to make that, that climate better? I think something very simple and, and easy is a lead by example. And, and what I mean by that is if you are having a, a safety stand down where we're talking about uh, different, where we're having a safety stand down where we need to uh, provide information to, to different people, having the commander up there being there while this stuff is going on, while they're talking about you know seeking out mental health or getting getting care, because sometimes there's a difference between a commander that gets there, he's in the morning and says, "Hey, good luck, we got some great training," and they leave, versus the time that they stay the entire day. People watch that, people see that, mm -hmm. and so they will they will notice. Okay, is this really important or or not? The other thing is. Uh, I would say, like I said, I mentioned before in my introduction, I've been in uh, almost 21 years now, and I have seen a, a really good um, change when it comes to 
trying to attack and dispel the, the stigma. Mm-hmm. And so I think we've done a really good job. People coming in now, the, the younger generation, it isn't much of a... I don't want to say the stigma is not there, mm-hmm. but it's not that what it was 20 years ago right. when I was in. Right. And the, the leaders now, um, they have also grown up in a, situ- in a system that we have been doing our, our best to dispel stigma. So there, there's still some, some leaders that you know, a lot of times it's more educating them because the younger generation, they seem to be just fine. The other thing that I would say is seek out you know, treatment and help because there may be something that you're concerned about, like, oh, I don't want to see anybody because I'm worried about how my, this might affect my clearance mm-hmm. or my flight yeah. status or, or different things. And it is completely appropriate to be able to talk to, hey, before I start really getting into all my details, mm-hmm. provider, mm-hmm. this is, I've got some concerns. What might you have to do? What are the things? And, and let the provider be able to, we like to show you all our cards face up. It this is, is what's, what's yes. going on. This is what might impact <clears throat> or not. Because a lot of times it's the fear of how things would be impacted. And then you realize, oh, that really isn't going to impact me uh, at all. Bad. You know, yeah. I'm not going to lose my clearance or, right. um, you know, or anything like that. And I was just too worried. So go in and talk to a provider. Yeah. So a lot of times maybe, it's education. Maybe at the same time I can get care. Yes. And still be able to return. To, to my uh, line of duty, my job, exactly. whatever I'm doing. Exactly. So, yeah, that's, um, that's real good, you know, and, and transparent, and that's what we want to seek, and I think that's a good way to address stigma. Uh, but while we're on the subject, and I believe that uh, you kind of alluded to it in your response, you're talking about changing the conversation, mm-hmm. talking about how some of our leaders who are coming up now, you know, they, they get it, you know, and they're, they're more comfortable talking about it, how a level of, uh, um, you know, um, IQ in that area, mm-hmm. if you will, uh, and how to uh, emotionally approach something and, and realize that, you know, because of the way that I approach it, doesn't mean that I'm less of a man or less of a Marine or less of, you know, a woman, you know, in uniform. Uh, it, what, it, what it really means is I'm more of a leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I guess... What I'm asking you now is, you know, maybe some tools of the trade that you picked up over time on how to change that conversation. Can you help us with that? That's a great question. Uh, I would say, you know, some of the tools is we are all on the same team. Mm -hmm. So to constantly have uh, conversations with providers, providers with leaders, so they can really help provide feedback to the leaders because it might be unique to their to particular unit or the installation or what's going on, what what may be helpful at one place may not be helpful for for, for somewhere else. So are we constantly having those uh, those meetings? Mm-hmm. And the, the reality of, of life is providers are overwhelmed, um, access to care. They're trying to see as many people as possible and they're sort of stuck in their office trying to do as much as they can, but they don't have the opportunity a lot of times to get out of their office to talk to uh, the commanders. And the commanders, mm-hmm. they've got so much stuff on their plate, mm-hmm. they probably don't have a whole lot. Of, so right. there, a lot of times isn't that communication. So as much as you can foster an environment of collaboration, yeah. whether that's in you know the uh, force uh, preservation meetings or in some sort of quarterly meeting where, where you're kind of meeting with people, it's it's building those relationships and being able to to talk one on one. That's probably the the best thing that that can happen because once you have that relationship, you can really overcome any of the the issues that are going on specifically with within that unit or that uh, that that situation. It's right, really building right. those relationships, and when that's not there, it's it's difficult and like I said before, the reality is it is challenging with all our other responsibilities and pulled in all these other directions to be able to take the time to pick up the phone or take the time to get out of our offices and, and go talk with one another. Okay. Well, you, you know, uh, it's a great segue into the next topic that I want to talk to you about this morning, Commander. And you mentioned the communication level, mm-hmm. level of collaboration that can go on between uh, commanders and providers and just really anyone who is a resource out there for our service members. And I get to uh, um, every day serve with stakeholders is what we call them here at Headquarters Marine Corps. And we call it the Marine Corps Suicide Prevention System, uh, jam-packed full of stakeholders and resources for our Marines and sailors to, um, to, to be served by. And so as I think about that and as I listen to your response, I couldn't help but 
recall uh, that whole no, uh, no one place, no one uh, no wrong door access, approach. no wrong door. That's it. And and so I'm like, okay, so let's talk about that a little bit uh, because I believe this uh, communication between commanders and providers can also facilitate opening that up. Couple of doors that come to mind: uh, community counseling program the Oscar extenders, uh, medical, and so forth and so on. Uh, they're all out there. So uh, is that the case? And do, would you support um, if someone said, well, there is no wrong door? Would you, would you agree? Yeah, I, I would completely agree that there's no wrong door. I, I would ha have a caveat that there's sometimes a maybe a, a better door, a better door uh, okay. uh, approach. Uh, and what I mean by that is we do have these amazing services, amazing uh, resources that are available. Uh, and leaders want to make sure that their uh, Marines are taken care of and taken care of to the best possible way. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, what I see as a clinician <clears throat> is if there is any any concern going on, well, they need to go to the MTF because I want them to see the, the board certified doc, the highest level of care, give my Marine the best treatment, which is fantastic, which is wonderful. That being said, just because you have a headache doesn't necessarily mean you need to go see the neurologist. Mm -hmm. There may be other places that they can go, and we have these wonderful services with CCP, um, you know, um, all these other resources that are that are available that maybe we can start at other levels, and those providers uh, providing those services are excellent at knowing their lane, knowing, you know, okay, this is sort of maybe outside of my scope, I need to make a referral, or back and forth to get them to, to, to the right place. And so, again, when we talk about access to care, that is one of the reasons that I'm sure you, you've heard about it, leaders you know, experience it, Marines experience it, where you, you call up and I need to see somebody, and it's, it's a huge wait time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that might be the reason is everyone is going to the MTF, uh, and so, and maybe that isn't necessarily the most appropriate place for them. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see everybody that comes in my office and, and help them with, with anything that's going on. Mm -hmm. But maybe they can be better served in other other places before they get to me. Right, right, okay, and that is absolutely great. Um, and so, my one of the last questions that I want to do in the process of wrapping this up here this morning, Commander, mm -hmm. is. Um, this is this particular uh, podcast. I wanted to come from the provider standpoint. I wanted the owner to hear what the, a provider would say in an effort to collaborate better with a commander. Mm -hmm. And that there will be uh, an episode where we will do it from the other perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, what I want to know is if you were going to give other providers uh, some tools and techniques for on this whole conversation about access to care, mm -hmm. that they could talk to their commanders that they're serving with, uh, what, what would you tell them to use? I would say the most important thing is collaborate and get out of your office. Okay. Um, make, make phone calls, have meetings with, uh, with people. And I know that that can be a challenge because we are Again, got your, your caseload for the day and all the people that you need to see, and maybe I don't have time to, to get out of my office. But if you get out of your office, you make those phone calls, you make those collaborative meetings, whether that's with leaders, whether that's with the other services, resources that are available on the installation, you'll find that you can work more efficiently. I think we, we do a good job of working hard, but maybe we're not working smart. Um, and so how can we be more efficient in, in what we're doing? And so having those collaborative discussions, being able to talk with, with commanders, being able to, to have that relationship with them. So if there's a situation comes up and I have to tell the, the CEO, here's a, a situation, I've got this taken care of, I will let you know if there are any issues. Uh, if I've already built a good relationship with that commander and he trusts me, he'll be okay with that. Mm -hmm. If I don't have that good relationship and that trust, it's like mm -hmm. that's not going to be enough information. It's like I need, I need more. I, I'm supposed to just sort of wait for you to tell me that, well, I have to build that relationship. So okay. get out of our offices. Have, have those conversations. It is easier said than done because of the, uh, the, the burden and responsibilities we have with, with our, our caseload, our workload. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think if we take the time to, to put in the effort early on, we can then make sure that we are working efficiently and smartly and, and making sure people are going to the services, like the better door approach and getting where they need to be so we can take care of those uh, clients that are 
uh, most needed at the MTF level versus at the CCP level or, or any other place. That is awesome, Commander. And, you know, at the end of every uh, podcast episode, we do a call to action. <laughs> and I'm going to let you do that this morning because you sound like you're just right there. So I'm going <laughs> to let you do it, sir. What would you say to our commanders and our providers if you want to give them a call to action on this subject? Listen to one another. Uh, talk with one another, but it's not just talking, it's, it's listening. Our doctors need to, you know, don't trip over your MDs and PhDs. You know, you're really smart, but you don't understand the line. Mm -hmm. And line officers, you got great information, but listen to the doctors. Yes. And so be able to not just talk with one another, but listen to, to one another. And I think if we we're able to do that, uh, the sky's the limit. And we're just going to continue to do amazing things. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Commander. And I really appreciate you being with us this morning. And thanks to all of our listeners for listening to our podcast. Uh, again, I'm your host, Dr. T.J. Owens, uh, and I want to remind everyone that suicide is preventable, but only if we empower ourselves and others with the knowledge, tools, and resources that are necessary to do so. If you want to know more about how to get involved, check us out on the Man uh, Manpower and Reserve Affairs website. Uh, you can get to our suicide prevention page by clicking on Active Marine going to the Marine and Family Programs Division, drilling on down into Behavioral Programs, and there you will find suicide prevention capability. You can also communicate with us over email at hqmcspc at usmc.mil. If you or someone you know is in crisis or at risk for suicide, please reach out, connect with CARE, or call the Military Crisis Line at 988. You can also call Military One Source, 800 342 9647. Until next time, goodbye.